Okay, so this is really just a little like background on the timeline of Greece. So we start when we're talking about ancient Greece with the archaic period, which was from 600 to 480 BCE. So this period doesn't really get a lot of time or attention spent on it because it's really the classical period that art historians and historians are interested in and that have had a huge influence on Western culture. So we know that the archaic period was a thing. And we'll, we will look at a couple pieces from the archaic period just to show kind of the evolution of art, especially sculpture. But it's sort of a period where we're like, eh, stuff happened, but we really care about the classical. So we have the early and high classical period. And that was from 480 to about 400 BCE. And there's a really significant event that happened, which maybe you guys learned about, maybe not, that caused that period to really start. And then we have the late classical from 400 to 323 BCE. And then the Hellenistic period was 323 to 30 BCE. And this was a period where Rome was conquering parts of Greece and taking Greece under the, their control. So Greece became part of the Roman uh, Republic at the time and then the Roman Empire. So that is why we call it the Hellenistic period. So we're really gonna focus on the classical period. Uh, let me stop sharing this and reopen my PowerPoint because, as I said, my computer was really, really unhappy all afternoon and uh, not functional for a while. So I cannot minimize the Zoom while I am recording. Well, that's great, but I need to bring up a file. Might be hard to believe, but this is like 15 times faster than my computer was working earlier today. If that gives you a sense of just how painful my day has been with this machine. All right. Share screen, Greek PowerPoint. Thank you very much. There we go. Okay, so on the left, we have some Egyptian Ka statues. So you guys can use the chat box. Do you remember what the Ka statues were and why they were important to the Egyptians? Anastasia, I keep seeing you like shake your head and then it looks like you're going to type and then you shake your head again. Like, like you keep coming up with ideas and then you're like, no, it's just wrong. <laughs> so the Ka statues were meant to house the spirit after a person died. And so they were somewhat representational of the person, but 
especially with like the pharaohs, there was that really idealized like beauty. So, you know, it's kind of like looking at some Instagram influencer and you know, there's a million filters and makeup and you're like, they probably look somewhat like that underneath, but you know, we, we're not entirely sure. They could look really different. So those cast tattoos are working the same way. There, there's this perfection and idealism. And we definitely have some hierarchical scale going on because this guy is not that much bigger than his wife. So uh, we, we clearly have a gendered hierarchy going on, at least with these two figures. Okay, so we know these are cast statues on the left. The statue on the right is an Greek, who is a Greek Koro statue. So what I want you guys to do, use the chat or talk out loud. I promise nothing bad will happen if you talk out loud. And compare and contrast these two sculptures. So what is different between them and what's the same? Okay, so we've got some separation of the arms from the body. The right one, the Greek one is also unclothed. Shane just reiterated that. So our guy on the right is naked. Uh, yeah, maybe some kind of headdress, fairly realistic. Yeah, they're about the same level of realism. The same position the features are a little different. They are, you can tell like, yeah, the hair is different. There's a little more deep, there is a little more detail on the Greek statue. Yeah, a slimmer face and that could be um, a stylistic difference. It could be, I mean, there's not a huge difference in like the way that someone from Egypt looks with the way that somebody from the Mediterranean looks like there's a lot of similarities. Uh, it could just be that this particular person had a longer face. Thick base. Yeah, they're both standing on this kind of thick base. So they're not fully like freestanding. The Greek one has, yeah, I didn't notice that before, but the Greek one does have ankles and the Egyptian ones do not have ankles. So there's a little more um, anatomical correctness. The ones on the left, I, I think part of it is they're not as nicely made as the ones of like the pharaohs because these are, you know, they're more like middle, I don't want to say middle class people because it's not like there was a true middle class in Egypt that we know of, but they're more like you're kind of middle of the road people. So they're not like priests, like high priests or something. Anything else? I think you guys have pretty much hit on everything. So do you feel like it would be a safe assumption that the Greek statue which is somewhere from that archaic period, so around 600 to 480, was influenced by the Egyptian sculptures, Ka statues in particular. Anastasia is nodding. I can't see everybody, but I'm guessing. We can all see the resemblance between these two uh, sets of sculptures. So the left hand one is that Koro statue. So it was made around 600 BCE. So right at the beginning of that archaic period, there was a lot of trade between Greece and Egypt at that time because they're really only separated by, they're separated by a gulf, but there's a lot of islands. So it's pretty easy for early navigators to go from island to island or to use the islands as landmarks. So they were never really away from land. Like they were never out in the open ocean, just having to sail by like the stars or a compass. So there was a lot of crossover between Greek culture and Egyptian culture. And there is actually a colony of uh, Greeks who 
had come in and were living in Egypt. Um, and the Greek colonists started mummifying their, uh, their dead because they were picking that up from the Egyptians who they were living among. And so there's definitely this cultural crossover, but they were, instead of doing like elaborate, like carved masks or like painted, um, there were painted wooden panels that would be put over the face of the mummy. They started doing their own and they're super realistic and actually show some really advanced painting techniques. And now I'm kind of wishing I put them in the beginning of this PowerPoint. Uh, they were done with this type of paint called encaustic paint, which is a wax paint. And it's been really well preserved. I mean, they, they do not look like they're thousands of years old when you see them, they're really phenomenal. So there's a lot of cultural crossover, there's trade. Like I said, there's a colony or multiple colonies of Greeks living in Egypt. And so it's really obvious like influence that's happening. So the Greeks have these Koro statues, which are kind of similar to the Ka statues too. They're used to commemorate people who have died, but they're not used to like house a person's spirit. They're just used more like we use like statues or headstones. So they're kind of co commemorating uh, a specific person and usually a person who died heroically. And so Koros is just the generic name of all of these statues, at least the male ones. And this one was found in Attica in Greece. They're all marble. And then the one on the right is of a specific person called Kroisos. So that always leads to confusion. All of the statues in general are called Koros statues. That's like the type of statue. The one on the right is of a person named, it's a Koro statue of Kroisos. So the names are really similar and it is super confusing. But we can see on the one on the right that there's been some transition. We've uh, started to even, even more so in the last one, pull the hands away from the body. Um, and, and this position is really, it stays around for a long time because it's a really safe way to sculpt the marble without pieces like falling off uh, because stone is very heavy. And so we've opened that pose up a little bit more, but that like left foot forward, hands to the sides, thumbs pointing forward is, you see this like every statue from, you know, Ka statues to like these statues in Greece are the same exact position. Uh, there's more detail, a little bit more in the body. The proportions are a little more well-developed. This guy just looks more realistic. Uh, the hair or the wig possibly looks more realistic. And the reason that these are nude when the Greek or the Egyptian ones weren't is because for the Greeks, nudity was a form of honesty. And so the first Olympic games were actually with athletes who were unclothed, which sounds super uncomfortable to me because if you're running and you like wipe out, like that's, that just sounds painful. But it was to them a form of honesty. And so if you were presenting yourself to the gods, you needed to be honest. And uh, so this was their way of showing that honesty. And so now many of us, of course, you know, think like, oh, I'm I'm presenting myself before anyone important, God, the president, whoever, I get to wear my nicest clothes. And so the Greeks had a slightly different thought process for what you wore when you were uh, going to, um, to be before God or to be before somebody important. So please just go forward PowerPoint. It's all that I want in the world other than a million dollars. <sighs> okay, so along with these Koros statues, we have Kore statues. That's just the female version of the Koros statues. Uh, but this one from around 520 to 510, we can see that the artist kind of took a chance and uh, put a 
water pitcher or a vase under her arm. It looks like the rest of her arm broke off, so inevitably because heavy stone, um, and her arm was probably a little further out from her body. But this is the first time that we see somebody smiling in one of these statues. All the other statues have been very straight faced and this particular statue is smiling and she's also wearing clothing. So we start to see a, a shift um, as we start to be more interested in, you know, it, showing a broader range of expressions, showing a broader range of representations. Um, and we're starting to get closer to that high classical period. So we're a little more, um, we're a little more open to making changes to these really like strict guidelines to sculpture. So along with sculpture, the Greeks had a really uh, well-developed ceramic painting uh, artistic movement. And they had these vases that they started to paint with figures. And this is really the first time that we see like figural representation on ceramics. It was very abstract in most cultures before this. And they started with a style that was called black figure painting. And so they would go in and paint all the figures black. So everything that is on this vase that is black has been painted on and the red is the actual color of the clay. So they're using red clay. So they go and paint everything black and then they'd have to go in and like scratch out all the details to make them red again so that you could see them. So like if my pointer would come back, like the lines in this guy's chest right here, they would go in and they would scratch that back out. And uh, it was really difficult and it was really time consuming. So I know some of you guys have worked with clay and like trying to put like fine lines in clay is really challenging. It just makes a mess. Like you get little like tiny particles of clay and it's really irritating. Um, so it's not the easiest process to work with. So you'd think it would be kind of obvious, but at some point, somebody figured out, wait, what if we just paint the details in black and have a black background and have the figures in red? It turns out this is much easier. <laughs> and so this was a big change in uh, ceramics and especially in Greek art, allowed them to do a little bit more. And I wanted to show you guys these faces because they start to show some artistic techniques that we hadn't seen before. And so they start to show people from different angles. Now, instead of having that really classic like side profile or maybe just the straight front profile or the weird like twisted perspective, they're starting to show people in like quarter turn poses. And uh, so poses that are more challenging. So this guy is turned a bit his head is in profile, but his body isn't. And I mean, this guy is being held, like, you know, there's clearly some issues still. It's not perfect, but the artists are starting to understand how to represent the figure in three-dimensional space a lot better than they had before. Uh, and so these are all kind of towards the end of that archaic period still. And this one is what is called a bilingual vase. No, I want you to go back in the other direction. Thank you. So the bilingual vases had black figure on one side and red figure on the other. So they were popular for a while. Uh, and then they kind of became replaced with just the red figure because it was just a better technique for the artists to use. And so here on this vase by Euphemides, um, we have foreshortening. So some of you guys may know what foreshortening is if you practice art. So foreshortening is where objects that are closer are going to be bigger. Uh, and if you look at this, the this guy's hand or his fist is actually bigger than his face if we were measuring like strictly one against the other. We know that his fist isn't actually bigger than his face, but when things get closer to us, 
they start to look bigger and they look smaller as they move further away. And so Euthymides is actually understanding this. And this is really the first time that we see uh, this use of foreshortening. So he is, you know, beginning to play with that. And you can see it a little bit on this arm here. So some advances in artistic technique and how we can represent three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional surface. All right. So getting to this sculpture, which we don't have all of because he was very different than previous sculptures. This sculpture has a name, at least that we've given him, called Critios Boy. And it's a really famous piece from 480 BCE, which is the very start of that classical period. And there was something huge that had happened in Greece at this point in time that kind of led us into the classical period. Does anybody know what it is? I don't know if you guys studied this when you studied world history or not. All right, most people don't, so no worries. So right around this point in time, the Persian Wars had been going on. And so Greece had been fighting these wars. All the different city-states in Greece had united together to form what was called the Delian League because it was formed at the city of Delos in Greece. And so all of these city-states joined together to kick out the Persian invaders. And unfortunately, in the process, the city of Athens was completely sacked, so destroyed, raised to the ground. And we care about that because Athens ends up really being, for many, many centuries, the preeminent city in Greece. And a lot of this new artistic innovation is coming out of Athens. And that is because Athens was given responsibility for the treasury of the Delian League. So all the money that everybody paid to support this war effort. At the end of the war, they decided that the best use of that money would be to rebuild their city. Really great if you're an Athenian, not so great if you're another member of the Delian League who paid all this money in. So that did not go over well with all of the other city-states in Greece. But it gave us lots of great art, so we can be grateful for it. So at this point, there was this huge artistic renaissance. Not the actual renaissance, but there's this renaissance because all this money, all this rebuilding is happening. We get the Parthenon, uh, we get all kinds of other city uh, temples and, and other buildings. And so there's this revival. And we start to get really new sculpture. And so Critias Boy is very different from the other sculptures that we've looked at. And why don't you guys use the chat? Tell me how Critios Boy is different from thinking about those Ka statues and those Koro statues. Definitely more detail, and it looks like he might have had um, eyes, like something inserted at one point. Missing the arms, so we, you know, his arms are obviously not attached to his body. The right leg is forward is a big one. Yeah, he's his head is slightly turned. He's not looking straight ahead now. He's looking a little bit that way. Very different hair and. It could be that wigs fell out of favor or that wigs changed. Um, he would have had feet at some point, but clearly because we have this different pose, things didn't last. So Curtios Boy is in the start of this pose that's gonna be used for a while. We're gonna switch from that forward facing pose to, oh, we lost Chloe 
to this new pose, which is called contrapasto. I'm going to stand up and I'm going to try to do it. You're not going to be able to see me that well. This is way better when I'm in front of the classroom. So contrapasto is where one foot is forward, your hips are tilted, your shoulders are tilted, you're looking to the side. So everything is like on an angle. So think like the way models pose, like where everything is jutting out at some sort of angle. That's contrapasto. So your weight is on one foot usually, the knee is up, the hips are tilted, and you can see the tilt in his hips here. You can't see it as much in his shoulder. And then the head is usually slightly turned. So the Greeks get really obsessed with contrapasto and start using it all the time. Uh, and we start to see it in Critios Boy. And then it is a bit more apparent in their later statues. Thank you. Like this guy right here who is called the Riachi Bronze. And so we have another huge change here. The Greeks start sculpting with bronze. Bronze had been used before. We saw it when we looked at some of the uh, Chinese art, but the Greeks start making these life-size or slightly bigger than life-size human sculptures. And because of this, they can get an incredible amount of detail. So they're basically building these out of some other material. They're building them in parts out of clay and then making a cast of them. And then they're pouring the melted bronze into the cast and then they're kind of attaching the pieces to each other. And so because of this, because there you have started working in metal, metal has much more tensile strength than stone. And so they can have poses like this guy with his hand out. There's no base now. He stands completely on his own. Uh, they can just do so much more. There's so much more detail in his hair and his beard. And so this really frees up sculpture to be able to be much more realistic and have all kinds of different poses because we're no longer limited by the heaviness of that stone. So this particular piece was found in a shipwreck. Uh, I would say within the last 100, 150 years, so it's really an amazing find because a lot of the statues from this period in time, the metal ones, were melted down by later generations and reused. So we lost a lot. Uh, and so this guy was at the bottom of the ocean. And so he was preserved or at least not melted down and used for something else. And he is clearly standing in contrapasto. And we're going to see contrapasto again when we look at Renaissance art because there's a huge revival of Greek and Roman styles. And we'll see it when we look at the Romans too because they were all about copying the Greeks. And then this piece, this really famous piece, uh, Disco Bolus by Myron. Um, you can see we're starting to actually see the names of artists and sculptors. Uh, so they either signed their work or there's like historical written records where we pretty much know who made the pieces. And this is the first time we have a sculpture that's frozen in action. And so this guy is clearly in mid throw. We can see the tension in his body. We know exactly what's going to happen. So we know that he has been frozen in this moment. Not that, of course, it would have been somebody posing. But when we look at the statue, it's not meant to be read as somebody posing. It's meant to be read as that action is about to be taken. And so he's completely liberated from, you know, those really tight control poses. There is this little, um, looks kind of like the bottom of a tree. This is basically a strut that's supporting him because unfortunately he is made out of marble and so he really can't stand on his own without some extra support. So that's why we've got this kind of weird thing in the back. Uh, but, you know, his arms are no longer stuck to his body. And we have a very well sculpted body. And if you look at a lot of these Greek statues, their proportions are all the same. So the Greeks had this sort of system of ideal proportions where the whole body was eight head lengths exactly. And most people, when they're drawing the figure, they still use this measurement just as like kind of a basis for how tall most people are. They're around eight head lengths. 
but the Greeks to like everything was always eight head lengths. So they had this idea of perfect proportion. And that's really tying into their society, which was all about kind of idealized beauty. And I think a lot of that has kind of stayed with us. It's been perpetuated for the past 2000 years, these ideas of ideal beauty. And for the Greeks, that was actually religious for them. It wasn't just like, you know, something that was culturally important, it had significance to them. So they really idealized beauty and had very specific ideas of what made something beautiful or what made someone beautiful. And a lot of those standards are the same standards that get used now and that standards do go in and out of fashion. But I think right now we're, we're kind of in it, but also trying to move away from it as a culture where we're like, you know, having this like really limited idea of what beauty is, is not healthy for anybody. Uh, but we can kind of blame the Greeks for having that. We did inherit a lot of that from them. All right. What time are we at here? So this is an Athenian temple layout. And I want to talk about the temples too, because I want to talk about the Parthenon, since the Parthenon was a huge part of classical Greek art. And a lot of buildings were modeled after it. So to understand the layout of a Greek temple, uh, you have to know a couple of terms. And let's see if I can annotate, because I don't think that I have all of them. Let me look at my next slide. Oh, no, you're in annotate mode. You're not going to let me. So Greek temples are usually kind of named after where the columns are. And so there's three different types of column arrangement. And the first one is pro style. We see that a lot around here. It's really common in this kind of um, federalist architecture that trickled down into the common architecture. So pro style is where you have columns just in the front of a building. So I don't know if you guys ever take 33 over to Harrisonburg, but there's a brick house that's set like way back from the road and it's got like four or five white columns in the front. And I, every time I drive by it, I'm like, there's a pro style building. I need to take a picture of that for my art history kids <laughs> because it's just classic. So. Um, if you imagine this was the front of the building, a pro style building would only have columns here. So kind of like a porch almost. And pro means in front. So that's why we're calling it pro style. Then we have amphi style. And amphi means both. So think amphibians that can live in both the water and on the land. And we have columns in the front and the back, but not around the sides. And then we have Perry style, where the columns are all around the whole building, which is what we're seeing here. And I want you guys to know that because we, we are going to keep talking about it uh, because we will keep seeing buildings that are pro style or amphi style or Perry style. Um, the Parthenon is a peristyle building, so it has columns all the way around. And so you see a lot of buildings uh, at that same time in Greece that are also peristyle. And along with that peristyle, going along with those ideals of beauty, uh, the Greeks were also very much into mathematics and numbers as being beautiful, numbers as being perfect. So they kind of became obsessed with ratios and originally the ratio of the length to the width of temples and other religious buildings was three to one, always, always three to one. And then they kind of switched and decided it was two to one. So the ratios changed a little bit, but like they would build every single building with the same ratio because to them that was the most aesthetically pleasing ratio. There we go. 
so along with that, you guys do not need to know all of these terms, but I do want you guys to know some of them because we'll keep talking about them and I'll be like, blah, 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 pediment. And you're going to be going, what is a pediment? Um, so make sure that you do know these terms. So the terms you need to know are, first of all, column. So a column is like a round pillar. We're never really going to say pillar, uh, but column is round. The Greeks were all about columns. The shaft is, come on, the middle part here is going to be the shaft. The bottom is the base, no surprise. And then some of the columns have a top, which is called a capital, and some don't. Uh, so there are different styles of columns, kind of depending on the area of Greece that you're in and the time period. And above that is this rectangle of stone kind of divided into parts. That's called the entablature. So it sits on top of the columns. And then you have this triangular piece at the very top called the pediment. And inside that entablature, you have often what's called a frieze, not always, usually on the ionic order, uh, ionic decorations, you'll have a frieze. So it's just a running length of decorations. And on the older buildings and the older style, which is Doric style, you have this um, back and forth of these carved stones called triglyphs. They have like three lines carved in them. And then a metope, and the metope is where they would put their carved decoration. And so this style, this Doric style, is what the Parthenon is. And you're, I'm going to talk a little bit more about metopes. So that is a word that you guys should know. And then frieze, you kind of have just a running, um, continuous line of carvings. And then when you get into Corinthian style buildings, they don't have the carvings anymore. They've gotten rid of them completely. So Doric always has the plainest column. So if you're ever unsure if a building has Doric, Ionic, or Corinthian, the Doric really don't have much of a top. They don't really have a capital. You know, they just have a little kind of bit of stone here to make it bigger at the top. The Ionic have the curly cues. And then the Corinthian are always like super fancy. So they're fairly easy to distinguish from each other, at least in like classical Greek buildings. It gets a little more confusing as you go like into neoclassical and you look at buildings built during the Renaissance because they're kind of like, we're gonna be like the Greeks and have these columns and things are gonna be white marble, but then we're just gonna mix it all up. Um, so, it doesn't hold as true and as consistently for newer buildings as it does if you're looking at classical Greek architecture. So this is the Parthenon and it was built during that uh, post-war building spree that the Athenians went on. So it was built between 447 and 432. And those are exact dates. So it took them a while to get this building up to do all the carvings. And the Parthenon is on this hill in Athens called the Acropolis. And they're doing the announcement, so I'm going to stop talking. Please, for the afternoon announcement. Students, please remember if you're interested in esports or robotics, please email Ms. Shiplett. As a reminder, tomorrow is Friday. It will be Green and White Day. Please show your dragons.